want to slash thousands off your home loan repayments? Whether you're an investor or homeowner, we know how important it is to find the lender that suits your unique situation and with the best rate. If you've not compared your home or investment loan in the last 12 months, you may be able to cut your repayments today with a different lender. That could mean more money in your bank account and less stress when it comes to paying your loan. Find out why more borrowers are turning to Finney to refinance their home loans. Call us now on 1300 002 023 and find out what you could save. Or visit our website finney.com.au to book an appointment. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Grace Ormsby here. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. And and I'm standing in our studio here at North Sydney today, and I haven't done an in-studio podcast for a very long time, but it is absolutely exciting to be doing so. I've got Alex Lasry joining me. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you. First time in the podcast studios is, here, yeah. but you are an avid investor, and I know you've got a property background as well, um, working within the real estate space, and we're going to unpack all of that in just a little bit. But before we do, you obviously wouldn't be on here if you weren't a property investor. Mm -hmm. So what is it about property that, you know, brought you into the space and made you go, this is the way I'm going to be creating wealth or generating income for the future? Yeah, yeah. It's probably happened over quite a long time, I suppose, in terms of, you know, kind of how I've thought about the property market. I think early on, a lot of really good sort of influences around me in my 20s that I think really... You know, it showed me the way in terms of what property could be and, and how you build wealth and financial security through that. And I think that probably was my first trigger point to really start thinking about the role for property for me. And it kind of grew from there. And I think, you know, once you get into it and feel that excitement of, you know, landing your first property and then thinking about what comes next, it's somewhat infectious as to, you know, what kind of how that then plays out and how that journey starts to really uh, go from there. And to give some context to our listeners, you are the Chief Marketing Officer of Local Agent Finder, but you haven't always worked in the property space either, which I think makes it interesting um, that you've always sort of had this affinity with property. Yeah, I've done a lot of things. Actually, my first job out of uni was selling cars, of all things. So yeah, I've done a bit of everything. You would have Um, dealt with some sales agents then. I have, (laughs) yes. Yeah, yeah. They are a familiar breed. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely has helped being in the industry and about a year and a half now in uh, Local Agent Finder. Um, really enjoying that role, but getting a different sort of perspective, I suppose, to what's going on in the industry and how that then shapes how you think about, you know, kind of what your next kind of move might be. But it definitely has has really reshaped the way that I think about things where I didn't have that sort of influence early on, working more in sort of tech businesses and, you know, kind of fast moving stuff that yeah, had a very different lens to, mm. to what I'm doing now. And we'll have to unpack that in a little while. But before we do get to that, I don't want to give away your age here. <laughs> I don't know how comfortable you'd be with <laughs> Thanks, that. <Grace>. But <laughs> you're talking about early 20s, you know, mid-20s probably when you did start your investing. Yeah. Can you give us sort of a, a round about a year when that took place and, and yeah. when you sort of bought that first property? Yeah, self-incriminating here. So that would have been probably around 2010. So uh, it would have been post-GFC. Yes. A pretty different yep. marketplace to today. Definitely. Yep. Um, yep. Buying in Melbourne as well. Yep. So um, really interesting in terms of what was going on there. I think, you know, for me at that time, a lot of different options in terms of where you could go in your first foray into the property market. And that for me was really overwhelming, particularly, you know, younger, not having the experience and not really knowing which way to jump, but knowing that in my own head, it was an investment for the future and how do I make sure that I don't get this wrong? So it was a pretty daunting experience at that time and being that age and trying to make sure that you put your best foot forward, not knowing how that was going to play out in the future either. I bet. But as you mentioned, you obviously had some people that had your back that were giving you some advice there. Mm. Who were those people that you were going to at that point in time? Yeah. So first and foremost, a really, really interesting group of friends around me who were a little bit older and had already done a lot of this and had already, you know, walked this path and were keen to impart that knowledge and had success and failure and really kind of showed what that could look like in terms of, you know, what not to do and how to manage the process as well. I was also really fortunate to have a really good financial 
advisor at the time. Who, Which not many people do have no, in their 20s, do they? No, no. And it was, you know, you don't sort of realise the benefit until, you know, kind of later in life when, you know, you kind of realise the impact of that advice at the time. And I think the key thing for that person in my life at that time was a long-term view mm. as opposed to, you know, that really kind of short term, I just want to get into the property market. And that person really showed how to start thinking about what that property, that first property should be in terms of how it would unlock future opportunity to then you know, keep building out the portfolio as well. So that advice was really, really valuable for me. And as I say, not necessarily realising it at the time, but yes, with the benefit of hindsight, like many things, realising just how that really shaped the way that I thought about my property investment path and what it would be for me in the future as well. Yeah, super interesting because a lot of financial advisors, not to paint them all with the same brush, but they do often get you to look down the shares route or, you mm -hmm. know, to manage funds and things like that. Yeah. So for them to be saying in your 20s, you know, a property is the way to go about this. Yeah. And certainly there was definitely advice in those sorts of areas. The financial advisor I actually came across due to a passion for cars. So we were both quite avid car fans and really bonded over that. And at that time started talking about, you know, the potential pitfall of, you know, spending a lot of money on a car in your 20s, which as a lot Many of you know, people, people in their 20s doing. want to do. Yep. And, you know, how you could structure future growth to be able to then unlock those opportunities down the track as opposed to, you know, making a financial decision that might limit your ability to then get into things like property and the stock market. So that was the really sound advice that really shifted my thinking in terms of how I needed to think about where my hard-earned money was going and what I wanted it to do for me in the mm -hmm. future as well. So it was obviously a very measured approach to that first property. Uh, it was. In some ways, it was still a bit of a leap of faith. And as I was sort of alluding to before, there's a lot of options in Melbourne at that time. It was a bit of a boom and it was an apartment. It was off the plan and it was a boom of those mm. around. And so there were a lot of options in terms of, you know, stock on the market that, you know, was really attractive to me in terms of it was it was ticking the boxes of the things that I was looking for in terms of the ability to be a good investment property in the future. I actually lived in it for a couple of years at the start to unlock things like the government grants and those mm. sorts of things as well. But it was, uh, there were a lot of properties on the market that were ticking those boxes. And so by fate, I was working at Seek at the time and our CEO and one of the founders of Seek was building a house down by the water with a builder, SJB, who were also building one of the apartments that I was looking at. And I thought to myself, if the CEO of Seek is get yeah. using these guys, I reckon I'm onto something here. And that was ultimately what kind of shifted me in that direction, knowing that it was ticking all those other boxes that I wanted. But it was, yeah, you wouldn't call that quite so measured as uh, some of the other decision points that I was making at the time. I mean, it's a long-term game. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, considering you were in your 20s and there was a lot going on, I mean, the stimulus as well you brought up. There yes, would have been a lot yep. of that flying around in 2010. There was, yeah, there was. And it was a good way. I mean, obviously for me, it was a good way to, to get me into the market sooner. I think, yeah, probably if I had had to save that money, it would have taken me a lot longer to get in. So at that time, yeah, it was definitely something that expedited my foray into the property market. I want to take a quick break in just a second, Alex. But before we do, I think which will be a really great way to jump into the next segment of the podcast is can you just unpack what you've done since then? List through some of the more recent investments you've made and, yeah, and so then we can unpack all that on the other side yeah, of the Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think that one I was talking about was very much a inner city apartment property, mm -hmm. which from a strategy perspective has really become something that's about yield as much as it is capital growth. The others have then started to move into outer suburbs and really looking for capital growth. So really trying to diversify the strategy to make sure I'm not locked into one part of the market that presents some risk, really. So much more to unpack. See you on the other side of a break. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm joined by Alex Lazary, keen investor. And 2010 was definitely an interesting time, as we've already mentioned, post-GFC. Melbourne markets, a lot of development going on at that time. Mm. Um, that was 12 years ago now. Yeah. You being from Melbourne yourself, you would have seen a lot of changes through that period. Huge amount of change, yeah. And a lot of development continued through that time, which I think, you know, you can easily get into the pitfall of finding one of those areas where you don't get a lot of that capital growth. And I think that's probably been one of the, the challenges for people in Melbourne is how do you make sure you don't go down that path as well? 
and really, you know, how do you surround yourself with those people that can give you that advice and understand, yeah, what's going on in those particular areas to be able to make those right decisions as well. So that first property, what suburb was it actually in? So it was in Melbourne itself. So what, right what's on, that postcode? Uh, 3004. Nice, a nice <laughs> postcode, really central. Yeah, and right on Albert Park Lake, so, so looking over the lake, uh, trams right behind it, a lot of infrastructure around, easy arterials out to you know freeways and those sorts of things. So from a rental perspective in terms of attractiveness to the rental market, you know, something that I think really ticked the boxes for me, as I was saying before, that was key in terms of what that criteria really looked like for that sort of investment for me. Knowing you were going to be living in it, mm. did that change the way you also viewed what you wanted? You know, did that have much of an impact on that? You're nodding your head like, yeah, yes. Yeah, it did. And it's one of my lessons <laughs> yeah. as well. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I would necessarily ever buy to live in and then lease out in the future again, but it's definitely something that with the benefit of hindsight, I look back and go, There were things I really looked for that weren't necessarily important to my investment strategy that were important to me at the time that I was applying to that property, yeah. So for the sake of all the listeners and not having to make the same mistakes that you've made, what were some of those things? So I said before I was buying off the plan, that was definitely one of the things that I wanted something that was new Mm. and, you know, new to me versus new to everyone, I think is probably a lesson that I would encourage people to think about. That's a good way to put it as well, because it does, you know, and anyone that's buying, it's going to be a new experience. It doesn't necessarily need to be a new property to do that. No, no. And I think probably what I learned with the benefit of time now is that, you know, you don't necessarily get the capital growth early on from those sorts of purchases. But I think definitely yeah, thinking about what's really important to the long-term strategy is what you need to do in that regard. But I think, you know, there was a level of stress around not being able to see what you're actually buying as well. That was probably something that I probably wouldn't do again because it just made it a little bit a little bit tough to visualise what this was going to be and something tangible in front of you. You could go, you know, okay, well, I understand what this is going to look like and I'm confident with my purchase. That off the plan obviously is not something that you get. So that definitely made a difference and created a stress point at the time that I probably, with the benefit of hindsight, didn't need. And have you still got that property? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's been worthwhile, it has. even though you've had yeah. some things that, like, has it bitten you in the bum at all, like going down that route? You just got lucky? No, no. I, mean, I got lucky, but also I've got some legal professionals in my family. And one of the biggest things through that process was having a really strong lawyer conveyancer. And so there was a a piece, a clause in the contract for that property, which basically stipulated that they were going to do soil testing on the site. And if they found anything that needed to be rectified, that it would be the purchasers of the apartments that (gasps) would need to pay for the rectification, not the developer. And so my lawyer pulled that out and said, no, we're not agreeing. We're not signing this until you remove that clause. We went back to the developer and and they removed that clause, but they also commented that I was the only person who had requested that that be removed. And so I felt pretty lucky at the time, but also it came back to the point I was making around surrounding yourself with people who know what they're doing when you're first entering the market is really key because that piece of advice and talking to the lawyer about it at the time, that could have been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to rectify that soil. Yeah. That we would all have had to have paid for. I would have been the only one who didn't. So I think that then for, you know, the future really just taught me the value of having strong lawyers and strong conveyances as part of that process who you can really fall back to and trust and and take their guidance. Wow, that is quite a cheeky. I haven't heard of that kind of contract clause Mm. before. Obviously, we've had a lot of issues up in Sydney Yeah, yes, with regard to the construction of new buildings and a lot of the ones that have been built over the last 20 years haven't necessarily held up that well already. But to have that in the contract... Yeah, pretty full on to have been a first home buyer and then to have had to have, I wouldn't have been able to do it. No. Uh, and it would have really changed the direction for me for quite a long time financially. Well, even the fact that you flagged it mm. and the developer's gone, no one else has done this, but they're not going to do anything about the fact that no one else saw it. No, no. Frightening, really. Yeah. 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 And this, as I was saying before, this was, you know, a really good developer that I thought was, you know, kind of, well, was the best of breed, really, mm. um, certainly for the time. But, yeah, there's some interesting Gosh, things in there that, that kind of lurk in those contracts, yeah. 
So once you did move out of that property, mm. um, it's been tenanted ever since. It Have has. you had any issues with that? No, I've had dream tenants. Yeah. Dream tenants and a dream apartment in terms of the quality of the build. So yeah, definitely, you know, kind of the, the hunch with the CEO from Seat was definitely on the money. It's been an, an amazing investment property that has got really good yield. And I think, you know, going back to those things that I was looking for at the time in terms of what made an attractive property for a tenant have played out really, really well for me. So I've had really consistent tenants in there for long periods of time and, uh, yeah, a really, really just low-maintenance property that has allowed me to unlock the next one as well. There you go. So let's talk through the specs of this property. One bedroom, mm. two bedroom? Two bedroom. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, as I say, brand new, really well fitted out, good balcony, as I say, looking over the lake. So an element of space that a lot of those apartments being built at that time probably might not have had. Mm. And that was probably what I felt really set it apart as well and trying to find something that wasn't the cookie cutter apartment that would have a little bit of differentiation to it, knowing that at the same time I was buying an apartment in a development and being really realistic about that. Because there are a lot of those apartments that mm. have sprung up down in Melbourne. I guess it slowed down a little bit through COVID and I want to talk to COVID yep. and what would have happened for you over that period in a little while. But yep. yeah, obviously you went slightly against the grain. You went with the trend, but but mm. it's obviously paid off for you. It so has, yeah. positively mm. geared. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. And yield slash yield versus capital gains, where have you sort of that one, uh, oh, it's that. increasingly becoming capital gains, yep. but it has been for a long time a really strong yield. And as I say, that's allowed me just to then put that money aside and then work to the next one. And that ultimately is, was always what I wanted for that apartment. So it worked out well, bit of luck, bit of planning, but it worked out really well. And the fact that you still held on to it now, you've obviously got further plans for that, you know, down the track too, but... That second property. Mm. So that's obviously unlocked equity or, or just savings for you to then go ahead and, and make a second yeah, a purchase. Yep. So when did you make that second purchase? Uh, that would have been about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk us through the uh, second so, property. Yeah. So the midst of COVID, yeah. Um, which, yeah, to your point before, like very interesting time for buying property at a time when, you know, people were going and, you know, paying for them sight unseen signing unconditional contracts, it was a pretty uh, pretty crazy time buying something. But it was very much, the next one was very much about how do we diversify out of something that's quite different as yeah. well and make sure that we've got more capital growth than anything and really research really, really hard what are the areas of growth around Melbourne and where should we really be putting this money. So we ended up out in Carrum Downs. So yeah, very, very different mm. to looking over Albert Park Lake, that's for sure. But yeah, very, very different property, townhouse instead of an apartment and yeah, very low maintenance, but well tenanted as well. So what point in COVID was this? Because being from Melbourne, you spent a lot of time in lockdown. Yes, we did. Yeah. Um, was it in lockdown when you made that purchase or? Uh, it was in between lockdowns okay. and I can't remember which ones it was now because we did have absolutely yeah, have a few, few of them. That's fair enough. Um, it would have blurred into one. Yeah, they did. But yeah, it was in between. And the interesting thing about COVID was that in a lockdown, it actually gave us a lot of time to do a lot of research. And so we really actively chose to use that time effectively to, you know, tap into what was going on in the market, to tap into our advisors and the people around us and really understand what the right sort of property would be, knowing that we have a really specific goal around what we want to do with these properties in the future and therefore what, how would it basically meet that goal for us. A lot of people were really worried, especially, you know, during the first lockdown about what would happen to property prices, especially mm. in Melbourne where there was such an exodus. Mm. Did that weigh in on your thinking at all? Yeah, it did a little bit. But I do, again, it came back to the research of, yeah, what's going on in those specific areas as opposed to treating Melbourne as just, you know, one single market. Uh, there was a lot of differentiation going on in different areas of Melbourne that was driven by what was going on at the time. So I think it was really just back to that, really, how do you research really effectively to have a really good temperature check and know that, you know, you are doing it with a level of confidence because you're using data rather than just emotion or a hunch effectively. Mm. Yeah. As well as the confidence piece, did it feel like a good time to buy? Do you feel like you got a, a bit of a bargain or a discount? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we got in at the right time. Because it's exploded since again. You yeah, know? it has. It has. And we've been fortunate in that regard in that, yeah, it's worked really effectively for us on that. So positively 
Also positive yep. within. Yeah. How yep. many bedrooms? Uh, that's three and a study. Yeah, and yep. then garage, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yep. yep. big double garage. Yeah, very, as I say, very different to the, the apartment. Uh, yep. Yeah, and good tenants since then too. Great, yeah. Yeah, again, very fortunate. I don't have any horror stories no. of tenants, unfortunately, for you. They're but um, always one I'm of the best okay things. No, yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> that, no one wants a bad tenant and the fact that you've got them. I mean, Melbourne is you're going to have so many people. It's more transient, but it doesn't sound like that's affected No, not at all. Not at all, no. I mean, yeah, the first one, what's that now, 10, 12 years and two tenants mm -hmm. in that one. So, yeah, yeah, it definitely doesn't play to the transient nature that people talk about Melbourne. And Karim Downs, like through COVID, did you get that tenanted straight away? Did you go, we need to undercut this rent? You know, was that ever anything that you had to deal with or consider? No, it was already tenanted. Okay. So that just rolled through and then the rent went up. And it's, yeah, just continued to play out that way. So, yeah, we've been very lucky in that one. So no complaints from you there. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dream run, really, yep, through COVID yep, yeah. especially. Yeah, particularly, yeah, as you say, with what was going on with, with Melbourne and lockdowns and dealing with all of that, it was a, a positive mm. thing, yeah. And I guess as well, flowing on from that, a tenant probably doesn't really want to be moving when there's that many lockdowns and restrictions no. taking place either. Yeah, and I think, again, if you're buying the right property that's got the things that people need. I mean, obviously COVID, what COVID really changed, and I think, you know, universally, but particularly for Melbourne was uh, what the likes of, you know, Bernard Salt calls the Zoom room. Mm. Uh, you know, how do you make sure that you, you can accommodate working permanently from home through those periods of time? That I think we definitely had that as part of our consideration when we were looking for the place that uh, was in Carum Downs and, and also the apartment and kind of catered to that as well. Yeah, good internet connection, really. Must. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> You'd have been looking at that too during yep. that period. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take another break there. We'll be back very soon with more from Alex Lasbury. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm joined by Alex Lasbury. And Alex, so you've got two properties at this point in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's going pretty well. Everything's positively geared. Yep. Where do you go to from there? Yeah, so it's definitely more on the cards. I think you know what we want to look at, which a lot of people have done through COVID, and we sort of sat a little bit on the sidelines, waiting to see what happened with more of a coastal property. Mm. You know, Melbourne coastal properties through COVID went pretty crazy, but that's definitely what we're eyeing off next. Is how can that add a, th a third dimension to our investment portfolio, and and then utilise the three of those to yeah keep generating that wealth so that we can ultimately kind of meet the goal of being debt free and, and having no mortgage at all. That really is, you know, from my perspective, what I'm trying to aim for. And so it's how do the properties that we're adding to the portfolio really add to that that goal. Are you planning on doing that off just three properties or will it be, you know, a few more that come onto it before A few then? more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. So you've got a bit of a plan in place. Yep. But obviously quite flexible and, you know, see what is going to happen. I'm curious as to why you've stuck within the Melbourne yeah. bounds because a lot of people, you know, don't look – well, not many people are really seeing Melbourne as a, an attractive place for investment at the moment. Yeah. But living there, I guess, is going to help there too. It does, yeah. That's yeah, absolutely right. I think really if you know the area, that helps. And from the perspective of buying interstate – yeah, how it's understanding how I would get the right kind of information out of that and the right research to be able to inform that kind of decision that is probably I'm more confident in doing that in Melbourne. Mm. And again, you know, to your point, I think that really comes to the timing and the right kind of property that you're buying to meet your goals, really, in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So are you focused then on that yield still? Is that what's going to get you that debt-free position or, or is there an element of capital growth that's coming in there as it's well? It's capital growth. Capital growth. Yeah, absolutely. So yep. eventually try and sort of sell some of them off or to, yep. Yep, yep. to, yeah. to achieve that. Yeah, I, I, I don't subscribe to never sell a investment property by virtue of the fact that that's what we're trying to achieve. So that's absolutely what's right for us in terms of yeah what we want to do. And you mentioned, well, earlier on, you work within the property industry. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear the 18 months or so that you've been in there. Yep. It's been a pretty wild period for it, to be honest. It has, um, a yeah. lot's been going on. Yep. But has that changed that strategy for you at all? Yeah. You know, or is hindsight just a wonderful thing and you kind of <laughs> wish you did something different earlier down the track now? There's definitely an element of that, but I think it, you're just exposed to a whole lot more in terms of the narrative in the market of really having a, a finger on the pulse when you're in the industry. And I think 
by virtue of that, you think differently about what you're doing. And to, you know, to your question around buying into state, it's definitely opened my eyes to that as you, you understand the difference in different markets and, you know, how do you really buy to, to deliver on your strategy? I think, you know, you can definitely go into to other areas that may not have been considered, but it's definitely reshaped the way I think about what the strategy could be in the future versus where I would have absolutely gone had I not been in the industry for this period of time. Mm. Yeah. And I think just it's worth flagging how many agents that you are working with all the time now. Like that would be so interesting mm. to – like do you think you're going to approach even that buying process differently? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think it definitely – opens your eyes to who those players are in that process and what their role is and how you can tap into the expertise. So, you know, beyond your your own research and, you know, obviously addicted to core logic and then those sorts of reports. Oh, it's so easy to be addicted, isn't completely. it? You just keep going. It's <laughs> a vicious cycle. Absolutely. But you know, and it absolutely feeds the hunger around around property, those understanding what's going on in the market. But I think who those players are, you know, what role an agent plays, you know, what role a buyer's advocate plays, for example, is it's probably opened my eyes to that in terms of how you can tap into the expertise and really use those to your advantage, as opposed to when I reflect on that first purchase, feeling very much on my own in terms of how to make the decision mm. uh, at the time and then really having to surround myself with people who would add that validation and that guidance. So I think now having a eyes wide open to the role that different people play and how yeah that can help you to arrive really confidently at a decision around what you're buying. Because I don't know about you, but I almost feel like now that I have so much exposure to the property space and mm. the real estate space, it almost does bring in another element of Thought, like choice paralysis. Yeah. But yeah. do you feel like you've got that at all or or do you still feel in a better position than you were when you were flying blind? Yeah, I definitely still feel in a better position. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's, again, it's the context of what am I trying to achieve with these properties? What do I want the outcome to be? And therefore laser focus on that. And it's I think it's okay to not have that that goal and just really want to be a part of the property market and an active investor. But yeah, for me personally, there's a there's a very definite goal and therefore I think, yeah, the choice paralysis is probably not something that plays into my mind as much. Are you still relying on and or drawing on the same people that helped you with that first yeah. purchase? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they've gone on to be really impressive property investors themselves over time and um, certainly a you know, peer group has definitely continued to be that and just really good encouragers to think about, you know, what comes next and how can you use that to your advantage. So, yeah, they're definitely all still very much a part of my life. That's financial good. financial advisor as well, that's, which is that's unusual. That's excellent, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you wouldn't want to be, you know, if those relationships had soured or, or you weren't in touch with those same people anymore, it's mm. going to have a bit of an impact, whether positive or negative. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I've definitely remained very close to that conveyancer as well. <laughs> as, yeah. <laughs> Given the impact that they had with on my very first good purchase. Reason. Yeah. <laughs> so then, yeah, I guess what's next? You talked about potentially a Melbourne coastal property. Yep. What is it that's still so attractive to you, I think, about Melbourne is probably a question that's worthwhile asking. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely the known quantity piece that's probably really attractive. I think it'll be interesting to see how that market does play out. And I think we all will be watching, you know, 2023 pretty closely in, in relation to that. But I think, you know, the diversification is probably strong enough across Melbourne that I, you know, that's my home and Absolutely. I kind of understand it. So, you know, open to new ideas and, you know, if another influence was to come in and really, you know, kind of make me think differently, then that would definitely be something that I would consider. I mean, we can't really be crystal ball gazing as to what's going on, but there are a lot of exciting things happening down mm. in Victoria at the moment, which has got to be exciting for you. Are you planning that next purchase within the next 12 months, 24 months? Yeah. Yeah. The next sort of six or so. Okay. Um, it's definitely time. Yeah. The hunger is definitely there. So everything's <laughs> prepped and ready to go. Is it basically just once you see the right property, you'll pull yeah. the trigger? Yeah. Yeah. And just, and also, yeah, just keeping an eye on the market in terms of, you know, what's happening there to understand how we can get the right kind of purchase at the right time. I think that's the key thing. And, you know, we've certainly at the moment, stock is probably not as high as it has been. So, the choice at the moment isn't as, as high as it has been. So, yeah, we're playing a waiting game at the moment, Grace. Mm, fair <laughs> enough. So then what will that property kind of look like, if you don't mind me asking? Yep. What are some of the features or specs that you're kind of hoping to gain? Yeah, so I guess, you know, diversifying further, freestanding house, a bit more land, something, again, that can be rented out, you know, um, 
coastal houses in Melbourne, you know, those kind of peak times around Christmas and New Year get a really good yield. So uh, looking at what that could be, I think is really key. You know, four bedrooms is, is probably mandatory when you're thinking about it in the context of that as well. So they're the main things at the moment. And I think, you know, particular areas around the coastal part of Melbourne have benefited really greatly from, you know, new freeway infrastructure and, and those sorts of things that have given it a bit of a kick along as well. So yeah, they're all the things that we're kind of playing to at the moment. But yeah, we'll just see what comes up. Exciting times. <laughs> it's got to feel good to know what that next step will be, even though you don't know exactly what it's going to look like at the moment. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And you haven't made too many mistakes along the way, but I would love to ask if there's anything. I mean, we've talked about not maybe not going off the plan again, but yeah. um, is there anything that you've sort of learned along the way that you could impart to our listeners? Yeah, it's, I mean, the point around off the plan, it's interesting because, you know, for me, whilst I talk about not maybe not doing it again, it was a pretty smooth process for mm-hmm. me. So I certainly wouldn't say never do it. It's just, yeah, make sure that it, again, you're not buying for you, you're buying for as an as an investor for what a tenant would want is probably the biggest call out there. In terms of the key things, I suppose it does come back to, you know, those kind of advisors around you and making sure you really have a long-term goal. They would be the big things that I think I kind of wish I could go back and tell myself at the start to really think more about that and make sure that you're thinking about that as a first objective and everything else would flow after that. But in terms of, yeah, other lessons, it's it's probably really around that. Mm. I mean, if you hadn't made any mistakes, then it wouldn't even be worth getting you on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no. But those mistakes haven't come through. Like they've been part of the learning journey and they've still got you to where you are today and, and yeah. ready to look at that next property. So it hasn't turned you off clearly. No, definitely not. On the contrary, I think, you know, the one thing I probably have learned is probably not to wait as long. Uh, that, you know, once I was kind of making the transaction around the second one, it was, uh, why did I wait so long to do this? Yeah. For, so it's, yeah, it's probably more so that than it is uh, anything else, you know, kind of build the momentum and maintain it and, yeah, you'll feel good after that and you'll really feel like you're kind of moving in the right direction as opposed to, you know, waiting and sitting there waiting for that property to appreciate in value and, and build the capital gains or, you know, bank the cash, kind of move as quickly as you can, mm-hmm. I think would probably be the thing I would do differently. So what you're saying is it's going to be exponential from here. <laughs> the next few are going to come That's Yeah, pretty that's much definitely the plan. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll yeah. have to get you back on the show once Love that's to. all Love happened. <laughs> Good luck with it all. Thank you so much for sharing your story and Thanks, I'll talk Chris. to you soon. Thank you very much. To everyone who is listening along, we hope you have enjoyed this episode. Like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Stay up to date with us on our website. Subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already and check us out on social media, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next episode, stay safe and well wherever you're listening from. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Have you signed up to HR Leader? Go to hrleader.com.au to subscribe. Receive the latest HR and people leadership insights and news.